When I played my first game back in 1996, I never imagined how far the industry would come. But now I know, and I know what games have stuck with me. Here's my list of the top 10 games I have ever played. As games become ever more serious and dramatic, I've always held that what matters most at the end of the day is still if a game is fun, if it can balance the weight and drama while still taking the player on a great adventure. When thinking of adventure, then, few would be able to skip over the Uncharted franchise. Fewer still would argue that the height of the franchise, as of right now, is not Uncharted 2. Uncharted 1 was gorgeous and cool, but its greatest strengths were its characters. The gameplay itself never felt quite right, and the plot was never too big a surprise, but the amazing presentation, script, and acting made it unforgettable regardless. Uncharted 2 took Uncharted 1's issues and made them a thing of the past, while dramatically improving what already made it great. It is in Uncharted 2 that we see Nate as more than an Indiana Jones clone, or, as Nolan North once joked, Dude Raider. We see the man for what he is, a thief, a scoundrel whose charm is a mask for the fear and doubt that lies underneath, built around unforgettable set pieces from a brilliantly told opening to the best train sequence in gaming to a thrilling conclusion, Uncharted 2's story digs deep into what makes its characters tick while never weighing the plot down with melodrama. Nearly everyone in Uncharted is lovable, and all of them have depth and legitimate motivation behind their actions and beliefs. It helps, then, that the strength of the set pieces was increased dramatically, and the actual gameplay was brought up to par to match the thrill of the story and characters. There's a definite impact to the game's combat, and it keeps things fluid in a way that other cover-based shooters have never matched. Uncharted 2 is far more than an especially pretty cover-based shooter. It is a fantastic, thrilling journey with lovable, meaningful characters wrapped around tight gameplay and an engrossing story. It is, in my opinion, Naughty Dog's finest game and one of the best games I've ever played. What makes a great Metroid game? Certainly, cool power-ups and tight controls and strong level design are a must, but many games are capable of that. What makes Metroid special, and what Metroid Fusion does with such ease, is establish feeling and atmosphere. Exploring the BSL station is an experience rich with equal parts mystery and dread. It sucks the player in through a perfect soundtrack and a story that was, while minimalist, quite compelling. The horror and fear of SAX, a parasite which lives in a power suit Samus abandoned, builds more and more as the adventure goes on, with its every appearance only further reinforcing how outmatched the bounty hunter will be. It's the inevitability of a conflict with SAX that crafts a compelling, terrifying villain and builds the fear of it being around any corner. This abomination is wandering the station just as you are, the game points out, and it's looking forward to meeting you. This game also marks one of the few solid opportunities to get inside Samus's head, as she has a number of inner monologues throughout the game. Always a walking enigma, so much of who Samus is has been established through inference and outside materials. Hearing her thoughts, then, was a powerful chance to understand what made her tick. Though it may upset those who hated Other M to know this, she seemed pretty focused on Adam even then. Yes, the level design of Metroid Fusion is utterly amazing, which without a doubt is why Fusion is my favorite Metroid game. The powers are cool and finding power-ups is as fiendishly addictive as ever. But for me, everything that builds the feeling of playing the game is what makes it a masterpiece. I won't beat around the bush. I'm a sucker for a good script, and Max Payne has one of the best scripts in all of gaming. The original Max Payne is as worthy an entry in the heroic bloodshed genre as any Hong Kong action flick, even more so than most, and Sam Lake's masterful script has much to do with it. Taken from a mechanical standpoint, Max Payne is a really, really good, unbelievably difficult shooter. The controls are slick, the action intense, and every battle hard fought. Any single enemy in the entirety of the game is capable of killing you in seconds flat. 
and such is the brilliance of Max Payne's gameplay. You are playing as a man who has about one notable power, and you'll need to use it as effectively as you can if you intend to make it through his journey alive. Few games have replicated the perfect punch of Max Payne's gameplay, and no game has ever built the kind of world and characters that it has. This is a crime thriller in which one of the major players, depending on who you ask, might be the reincarnation of Odin, and by that point in the journey, it just about fits with the vibe. Make no mistake, Max Payne is meant to be taken seriously, but it also wants to share a laugh or two before it smacks you in the face with a terrifying nightmare sequence or a brutal gunfight. There are simply no other games like Max Payne 1, its successors included, and no other writers like Sam Lake. Rockstar's efforts with Max Payne 3 weren't quite as imaginative, but strong enough that I personally hope this is one franchise that has some life left in it. I will make no secret of my love for the work of Shu Takumi, and when the man got to work on Ghost Trick Phantom Detective, I had no choice but to take notice. What I expected was a fun, investigative adventure. What I got was one of the most brilliant puzzle games, and one of the most genuine and emotional stories I've experienced in this industry. Ghost Trick depicts one night in the afterlife of Sissel, a man who's been murdered and left with all kinds of unfinished business. With the help of some of the most lovable characters Takumi's ever made, and some some awesome ghost powers, Sissel has a precious few hours to solve his own murder and save everyone he can along the way. To accomplish this task, he will have to use his powers to create elaborate Rube Goldberg mechanisms to get from point A to point B while repeatedly manipulating time. In these small windows of time, Sissel's given rain to affect the world around him to a certain extent, and these puzzles are equal parts gripping, challenging, and absolutely brilliant. The constant ticking clock causes a palpable tension, and every little discovery becomes a grand victory. The feeling of finally putting it all together, then, is one of immense satisfaction which only grows over time. Driven with immensely lovable characters, ingenious puzzles, an amazing story, and a perfect soundtrack, I cannot recommend Ghost Trick highly enough. Let's journey back to a time when talking about Bioware didn't kick off comment threads about the monstrous crimes of EA. Back to 2003, when Bioware created the greatest installment in the Star Wars franchise since The Empire Strikes Back. Knights of the Old Republic tied together Bioware's immensely talented writing team with a combat system that gave players free reign to choose their own level of investment. Structured with a cinematic appearance, but classic D&D calculations underneath the hood, Knights of the Old Republic offered all kinds of options for different classes, when combat came about, that is. The majority of the game, however, was what Bioware's best at, building incredibly strong characters through meaningful conversations and interactions, telling a great story, and even throwing in an amazing twist. The twist. Oh, man. Even 11 years down the line, I refuse to say much of it for fear of spoiling anyone not in the know. That moment is one of the great reveals in gaming history, and one of which I would ask, would you kindly not spoil? While the moral choices didn't always cut too deep, their presence marked the true beginning of their prevalence in gaming and allowed for unparalleled role-playing. Everything stemmed from it, and it allowed for meaningful changes stat and gameplay-wise while also legitimately affecting how the story played out. Perhaps what truly makes Knights of the Old Republic great is encapsulated in an easy-to-miss side quest. While scouting around the beautiful fields of Dantooine, the player comes across a crime scene and is tasked with solving it. Over the course of this completely optional quest, two characters are fleshed out more than main characters in most games, and the crime becomes as compelling as any truly great murder mystery. There's no combat in this mission, only cleverness, intuition, and good dialogue. It's that design decision, then, that makes it one of the game's bravest moments. Knights of the Old Republic is a game of beauty, of wonder, of, of heart and soul. Calling it a Star Wars game only is selling it short. This is a masterpiece any RPG fan can appreciate and absolutely must play. Speaking of beauty, then, I would be a failure to skip over arguably the most beautiful entry in the Zelda franchise. The Wind Waker may have inspired ire upon its first appearance, but there's no denying, in retrospect, that its art style is one of the game's best choices and a truly bold one in the franchise's tapestry. I recall one review of the game citing a classic Steven Spielberg quote about E.T. It's not a kid's story, but the story of a kid. 
Indeed, that describes Wind Waker to a T. Hidden underneath the majestic world in the Grand Quest is a tale of great loss and tragedy, a world that went awry despite the hero of time's best efforts. The magic, then, is how this journey, seen through the wide eyes of arguably the most charming and personable Link yet, becomes a tale of discovery, faith, and hope. Tear-inducingly beautiful music drifts through the game from the adventurous theme of the Great Sea to the unforgettable flamenco guitar that defines Dragon Roost Island. The Wind Waker is one of those very few games with which I could simply sit, stare, and listen. The world is one of peril to be sure, but failing to stop and admire the surrounding beauty is failing to appreciate one of Nintendo's greatest achievements. This mixture of riotous enjoyment, boundless curiosity, and thoughtful admiration is what sets The Wind Waker apart from the rest of the Zelda franchise. The Legend of Zelda, with each installment, allows designers to shape an adventure unlike any other from game to game while abiding by the tenets of what is a Zelda game. Opening up a grand world and giving the player a push out into it is how all adventures should be, and it's not often enough, particularly not anymore, that games actually do that. The dungeons are as gorgeous as they are clever, almost every puzzle one of action or momentum. The bosses, who regularly tower over our poor little hero of winds, exhibit some of Nintendo's most striking designs to date, proving that the art style chosen is indeed capable of gravity and reverence. And the final battle is so beautiful, with a denouement so surprisingly awesome that it's hard to believe our dorky hero is capable of it, that it stands as one of the series' best. The Wind Waker is an utter masterpiece, and my favorite of what the Zelda franchise has to offer. Few games encapsulate what makes them great in the opening moments quite like Mass Effect 2 does. Surprising, thrilling, dark, and emotional, the opening scene of Mass Effect 2 tells you what you're in for. A journey that will tear down the traditional sci-fi epic of Mass Effect 1 for something much more grim and serious. There is nothing sacred in this game, and everyone you meet may not still be around when the credits roll. Appreciate who you have while you have them. And it's not hard to appreciate them. It's been said that Mass Effect 2's big flaw is that it doesn't do much for the plot of the overarching trilogy. Even among those who present the critique, though, it's considered inarguable that this is a game about the characters, and what great characters they are. One struggles to think of too many losers in the bunch, and even those who aren't remarkably likable are still worthy of mention and attention. Zaid may be kind of a jerk, but that doesn't mean he won't provide an entertaining counterbalance to a Paragon Shepherd. Jack may be almost obnoxiously angry all the time, but that makes it all the more fascinating should the player look into her history. And the elusive man. Some of his choices made in Mass Effect 3 may have hurt the character, but during Mass Effect 2, his presence casts an imposing shadow over the game's events in a commanding and fascinating way. The elusive man defies easy explanation. A man whose priorities and end goal are hidden behind a cloud of cigarette smoke and a truly memorable performance by Martin Sheen. His morals complex, his methods secretive, the elusive man is exactly what the story needs to unbalance Shepard. Once upon a time, answering to the council was an optional and frustrating endeavor as they endlessly dragged their feet. This overseer, however, takes a different approach that it's almost puzzling. He watches and listens and waits. He is spoken of in hushed tones and speaks to Shepard very rarely. He is a triumph of a character. This says nothing of the game's dramatically improved gameplay, though concerns about the move from traditional RPG elements is warranted. On a moment-to-moment -moment basis, however, the changes made to Mass Effect 2 make it a stronger, more thrilling game. That those thrills are backed up by a slick presentation, great dialogue, and one of the best casts in gaming history is what makes it amazing. They're too busy building relations to put resources into verifying... On paper, Persona 4 should be a dull, cliched wreck. Trendy anime stereotype high schoolers come together to go on a dungeon-crawling adventure through the power of friendship? Don't get too original now. Thank goodness, then, Persona 4 is not an experience kept to paper. Atlas's RPG masterpiece was the PlayStation 2's swan song, and has since left a six-year legacy that will apparently only die once Persona 5 releases. 
The way director Katsuro Hashino has sculpted this cast, along with Shigenori Sojima's awesome character designs, is a masterwork. A balance is struck between imagination and relatability that most writers and designers would kill for. Yes, the characters represent very familiar anime archetypes. Hyped up, slightly pervy best friend, fancy, uppity girl with long hair, chipper and peppy pop star. The writers take these characters and ground them through the very real conflicts they face. That best friend puts on a goofy face to hide a deep grief over his lost love. The fancy girl feels trapped by her family obligations. The pop star is horrified by how her image and sexuality have been exploited. These truly intimate human conflicts are what make this game of anime high school and magical demons within tarot cards one of the most real and genuine games I've ever played. These characters are loved because they're us, each representing the conflicts all of us face on a day-to-day -day basis. It sinks even deeper as one finds that the dungeons themselves are work of character development. The Pop Stars dungeon is a trashy strip club, the soundtrack filled with inexplicable moaning and players battle with uncomfortably gesticulating enemies. The most romantic sight to be found is a pair of deformed monsters dancing as a couple. Beyond that, only the stark horror of sexual exploitation as seen through the lens of eldritch abominations remains. It is a visual metaphor fit for Silent Hill and it's only one example of the game's many artistic statements. A roller coaster ride of emotions and a great whodunit wrapped up in one, Persona 4 elevates beyond what could ever be expected of its premise. It sticks with anyone who commits to the adventure in a way few other games ever could. It makes statements about life, love, and what makes us human. It is utter brilliance. Did I mention I enjoy the work of Shu Takumi? Because I do, and he makes the list again with this, the third installment of the Ace Attorney franchise. This franchise has always been a favorite of mine, if not my most favorite, but ask any fan and they'll usually tell you the same thing. Trials and Tribulations is beyond any doubt the best installment. The quality of any individual Ace Attorney case comes down to the quality of its characters, and Trials and Tribulations as a whole succeeds, largely because its cast doesn't really have a stinker in the bunch. Case-wise, there's usually one per game that everyone doesn't care much for. No one seems to even remember Turnabout Samurai from the first game, and everyone I've asked confirms that Turnabout Big Top from the second is rubbish. But there isn't a bad case in the bunch here. That serves a greater, more fascinating purpose than the first two games accomplished. Trials and Tribulations is the first Ace Attorney game to properly establish an overarching conflict. Of the game's five cases, three of them work together to weave a dark, violent tale of arguably the most vile character in the entire franchise. This villain represents Ace Attorney perfectly. Surprising, charming, complex, and unlike anyone you've seen before. Their every arrival and appearance results in a gasp, their actions spoken of with mystery and horror. The game's love for one of its greatest characters is also one of its greatest strengths. Mia Fey, the mentor to Phoenix whose life was tragically cut short, is given such development in this game that it's hard to believe the woman hasn't been alive for the majority of the franchise. But no matter how much development she gets, she pales in comparison to the masterpiece of the character that is Godot. There is so much that can be said of Godot, the game's masked, coffee-guzzling prosecutor. Know that there is general agreement he could be the single greatest, most complex, best developed, most compelling character in the franchise. In some respects, he is nearly the story's protagonist. His backstory is as compelling and tragic as any the series has ever offered. His will and determination something of amazement. He defines trials and tribulations. He sets the stage with dialogue both hilarious and moving. He pursues victory for ends which are only at the end truly clear. He gives Phoenix Wright the fight of his life. Ace Attorney Trials and Tribulations is a triumph beyond any measure. It is the magnum opus of the franchise, and it stands tall enough that topping it may be impossible. What is a video game to you? A fun diversion meant to take your mind off of the sucky stuff about life for a little while? Or is it a window into another world, one where you can be more than any of us ever can be? Is it something else entirely? The folly of critiquing Final Fantasy X's story is assuming that it is only the story of Titus, its blonde-haired, kinda dumb, initially immature protagonist. It is, in some ways, the story of you, 
the player and, and what it means to play a great RPG. To enter the world body and soul, connect with the journey and lore and characters, form attachments and finally accomplish your goal and get kicked out to go back to wherever it is you were before. It's up to your own imagination whether or not you, as with Titus, will come back to it. Final Fantasy X is not, by any measure, a story of great triumph and glory. It's not the sci-fi horror of Final Fantasy VII or the navel-gazing character study of Final Fantasy VIII. It's a story of loss, losing life, innocence, love, family, home, joy. No one wins on a personal level in Final Fantasy X. At best, they come out a little better than they were before. Much of the cast has to take still being alive as the best victory they'll get. What can be said of Final Fantasy X's cast that hasn't already been said? Tidus, the avatar of the player, led along on this fantastical journey in a fashion not dissimilar to Alice falling down the rabbit hole. Orin, the representation of what we all wish we could be when we play these games, ever distant. Waka, the goofball friend who finds himself beaten down time and time again. A man who by the end has had everything he ever believed crushed into dust. And Kimari, who's kind of a douche. But Yuna. Final Fantasy X features some of the Listen most gorgeous visuals Squaresoft ever brought to the screen, some of its most this horrifying monsters, some of the greatest lore chance. it's ever written. It has wrung more tears out of players than many thought possible. No matter that. all of it, in the end, it comes down to Yuna. Yuna, the beautiful, dedicated, honorable summoner. The woman at the core of the story, and in fact, its true protagonist. Final Fantasy X-2 did not switch protagonists, it switched who you control. Yuna loses everything. By the end of the game, she's even blocked from her own home. She loses everything, and she keeps pushing forward towards a conclusion where she will finally lose her life. By the time she gets there, losing her life is something she's accepted. The story, ever cruel, decides to take the things she couldn't live without instead. Final Fantasy X can be praised for its combat system, my favorite in the series thanks to the chess-like strategizing it encouraged. Its artwork and design is nearly unparalleled, its soundtrack just the same. I could praise it for all of this, and I realize that I should. But at the end of the day, I struggled to speak of much but how brave it was. Could the Square of today release a game like this? Somehow, I doubt it. Final Fantasy X is the pinnacle of what it means to be brought into a video game world and taken on an adventure. It's the pinnacle of what great storytelling can be for and can do to the player. Final Fantasy X is the pinnacle of gaming. As of right now, there stands the list of my top 10 favorite games ever. An ever-changing list, I suspect it will be updated in due time. For now, it's a list I'd proudly stand by.